It is 9 p.m. on April 14th, 1912. Captain Edward Smith returns from a dinner party held in his honor at Titanic's a la carte restaurant to the bridge. Passengers at the dinner note that the captain did not even have a sip of alcohol throughout the entire night. On duty is second officer Charles Lightoller. Both him and the captain are aware that Titanic will enter an area of ice at around 11 o'clock, and they begin discussing the weather conditions in the context of this prediction. They mention how it is only one degree above freezing, and how the sea is perfectly calm with no wind. Lightoller comments on how this flat sea will prevent them from seeing a dog bone of foam at the base of icebergs, but in the same breath, talks about how clear the conditions are. The captain and Lightoller conclude that it is safe to proceed into the icy conditions due to the clarity, and that if any haze appears, they should slow down. The captain then proceeds into the chart room, where 4th officer Joseph Boxhall is making a stellar observation of Titanic's position. Boxhall reports the progress to the captain, who then continuously pops between the bridge, the chart room, and his cabin for the rest of the night. After his conversation with the captain, Lightoller tells 6th officer James Moody to telephone the lookouts to keep a sharp lookout for ice, especially small ice and growlers. Moody relays the order, but he omits to mention growlers specifically, and Lightoller has him repeat the order. At 9.52pm, senior wireless operator Jack Phillips receives a message from the Masaba saying, Ice report! Saw much heavy pack ice and great number large icebergs. Also field ice. Weather good, clear. This message is not directly addressed to Titanic, and Phillips is buried under passengers' messages. As a result, he does not take it to the bridge. Soon afterwards, a crew change takes place on the bridge. First Officer William Murdoch takes over as officer on the watch from Lightoller, and the lookouts are swapped to Frederick Fleet and Reginald Lee. Lightoller and Murdoch discuss the weather. Then, Lightoller proceeds on his rounds before turning in. At around the same time, the captain and Boxhall plot Titanic's progress in the chart room. They see the connection of Titanic's last three boilers to the engine's effect on her speed. At 11.07pm, Phillips receives another message which says, To Titanic, from California. I say, old man, we are stopped and surrounded by ice. The proximity of the Californian to Titanic likely surprises Phillips at how loud the signal is. Furthermore, the Californian's operator completely interrupts one of Phillips' transmission. As a result, Phillips responds with, Shut up, shut up. I am busy, I am working Cape Race. At 11.39pm, lookout Frederick Fleet spots a black mass ahead of Titanic. He remarks to Lee, there's ice ahead, while turning to ring the crow's nest bell three times. Many of Titanic's deck crew hear the bell, such as Boxall, who is on Titanic's port side boat deck, and quartermaster Alfred Oliver, who is on Titanic's compass tower. First officer Murdoch likely hears the bell from the starboard bridge wing, and looks forward to confirm what is ahead. James Moody picks up the telephone from the crow's nest. A desperate Frederick Fleet asks, Is anyone there? Yes, what do you see? replies Moody. Iceberg right ahead, Fleet says. Thank you. Moody hangs up and proceeds to the wheelhouse entrance, where he informs Iceberg right ahead to Murdoch. Murdoch, who has likely already seen the iceberg, shouts hard to starboard. Moody repeats the order to quartermaster Robert Hitchens, who puts his entire weight into turning Titanic's helm as quickly as possible. Murdoch then rushes into the bridge and sets the engine telegraphs to all stop. Lead stoker Frederick Barrett in Boiler Room 6 sees the light indicating the telegraph set to all stop illuminate. He shouts, shut the dampers, indicating to the other firemen to stop loading coal into the furnaces and to close them. Fleet notes that Titanic's bow begins to swing away from the berg as soon as he gets off the phone with Moody. However, fate is already sealed. Titanic's starboard side scrapes along the berg. Ice falls on the forward well deck and havoc is wreaked below deck. Barrett reports seeing the iceberg open up the shell plating two feet above the stokehold plate. He and the other occupants of Boiler Room 6 either proceed upward or retreat through the watertight door into Boiler Room 5. Alfred Oliver arrives on the bridge just in time to see the iceberg pass overhead of First Officer Murdoch. Murdoch then orders the helm hard to port before proceeding into the wheelhouse and closing Titanic's watertight doors. He orders the iceberg collision entered into Titanic's log at 11.40pm, just as the captain and Boxhall arrive on the bridge. Murdoch describes what happened and his actions to the captain. The captain immediately asks Murdoch to close the emergency doors, to which Murdoch responds that they are already closed. Boxhall, Murdoch, and the captain then all proceed to the starboard bridge wing and try to spot the iceberg. They also look for damage above the waterline. Boxhall then slips away from the bridge to begin an inspection below deck. The captain then orders Quartermaster Oliver to find Titanic's carpenter. Feeling the collision, both 2nd Officer Lightoller and 3rd Officer Pittman are woken up. Lightoller exits the officer's quarters on the starboard side and sees Murdoch on the bridge wing. He then proceeds back to the entrance where he finds Pittman. They speak about the collision for a moment before Pittman returns to his cabin. Lightoller takes a look on Titanic's port side before he does the same. The captain, noticing Titanic is not listing at all, feels comfortable after the collision. He orders the telegraphs to slow ahead and allows Titanic to continue forward for a bit. However, Titanic's trim was off prior to the collision. 
She was listing about 3 degrees support due to a large amount of coal being moved to Titanic's port side following a coal bunker fire. Titanic's even keel indicates that the ship is taking on water on her starboard side, which corresponds with the location of iceberg damage and the layout of Titanic's cargo holds. As a result, Titanic now lists 5 degrees to starboard, as noted by the inclinometer. With that, the captain orders the engine stopped. Soon afterward, Alfred Oliver returns to the bridge. He tells the captain that his order has been carried out. The captain then scribbles a note on a piece of paper and tells Oliver to hand it to Chief Engineer Joseph Bell. Following this, 4th Officer Boxhall returns to the bridge from his inspection. He went down as far as he could go without opening any hatches, and found no damage. He reports this to the captain. Already knowing that Titanic is taking on water due to her starboard list, the captain orders Boxhall to find Titanic's carpenter, just as he had to Oliver after the collision. Just as Boxhall descends the emergency staircase to B-Deck, he runs into the carpenter who reports flooding in the mailroom. Boxhall proceeds down to check for himself, and the captain, likely upon hearing the carpenter's report, also proceeds below deck, independently of Boxhall. Another crew member participating in damage inspections is Chief Officer Henry Wilde. He hears a hissing noise coming from Titanic's forepeak and inquires to lamp trimmer Samuel Hemming about it. Hemming reports that the sound is air escaping from the forepeak tank, indicating that it is filling with water. He also reports that the area above the forepeak tank is still dry. Wilde continues inspecting with this information. When Boxhall reaches the mailroom, he finds mail clerks carrying sacks of mail up the staircase from the lower deck. He tries to grab a sack of mail floating in the water but misses. With the confirmed flooding of the mailroom, Boxhall proceeds back to the bridge. Passengers report seeing Thomas Andrews descend the grand staircase from his A-deck cabin. He reassures them, saying that even if Titanic were split into three distinct parts, each piece would be able to float independently of the others. The captain arrives back on the bridge before Boxhall and orders all hands on deck. He likely tells Chief Officer Wilde and First Officer Murdoch to begin preparing Titanic's lifeboats as a precautionary measure. He also tells Chief Purser Hugh McElroy to begin mustering the passengers. He specifically orders not to begin filling the lifeboats. He wants to be sure that loading passengers into the lifeboats is absolutely necessary, as an evacuation at sea in the middle of the night, where passengers will be hoisted many feet above the water in pitch black before being cast into the open sea, is incredibly dangerous. Once Boxhall arrives back on the bridge, he reports to the captain that the mailroom is flooding. The captain orders Boxhall to wake the other officers and to help swing out the lifeboats. He wakes up Pittman and Lightoller, Telling them of the situation in the mailroom, he makes them dress faster. Boxhall attempts to wake 5th Officer Harold Lowe, but he is in a sleepy stupor and goes back to bed. Pittman proceeds forward to make his own damage inspection, while the rest of the officers proceed onto the boat deck. The captain then heads below a second time. He likely runs into Thomas Andrews, who is also making an inspection. First Class Steward Annie Robertson hears them remark, There's three gone already, referring to Titanic's watertight compartments. Pittman runs into some firemen on the forward well deck, who informs him that their place is flooding. They peer down the forward cargo hatches and see water flooding the cargo holds below. Pittman returns to the boat deck and helps repair the boats. The captain breaks with Thomas Andrews and returns to the bridge. He tells Phillips and junior wireless operator Harold Bride to stay on standby for sending the distress call. He specifies to wait until he gives the order. Passengers in the reception room see Thomas Andrews running up the forward grand staircase. He does not stop to answer questions like he did before. Instead, he is taking steps three at a time as he quickly ascends to the boat deck. Upon reaching the bridge, he informs the captain that Titanic is sinking. The first six watertight compartments are taking on water. While the water is contained within a coal bunker in Boiler Room 5, the other compartment's flooding is uncontrollable. Once water reaches E-deck, it is able to flow over the watertight bulkheads and into the next. This is Titanic's death spiral. Immediately, the captain orders the wireless operators to begin sending out the distress call and orders the passengers to come out on deck. 5th Officer Harold Lowe is awoken by the commotion on deck and sees passengers wearing life belts. This communicates to him the severity of the situation and he joins the rest of the crew on deck. While helping to swing out the lifeboats, Boxhall hears a report of a light on the horizon. He proceeds to the bridge and confers with the captain about it. They clearly see the light. First, Boxhall asks if he should send out a distress signal, to which the captain responds he has already done so. Next, Boxhall asks what position the captain used, and the captain responds that he used the 8 o'clock dead reckoning. Based on Boxhall's earlier stellar observation, the Titanic should have been far ahead of that position. Boxhall tells the captain that he will work out an updated position and give it to the wireless operators. The captain approves. Finally, Boxhall asks the captain just how serious the situation is. Smith responds, Mr. Andrews tells me he gives from an hour to an hour and a half. Harold Bride reports to the captain that the Cunard liner Carpathia is on her way to Titanic, and that she will arrive in four hours. Bride is thanked by the captain and he returns to the wireless room. On the starboard side, a passenger asks 3rd Officer Pittman to begin filling lifeboat number 5.
Pittman, upon realizing that this passenger is actually White Star Line Chairman J. Bruce Ismay, goes to the bridge and asks the captain if he should begin filling the lifeboats. Smith responds, Go ahead, carry on. And the boats on the starboard side begin to be filled with passengers. Similarly, 2nd Officer Lightoller asks Chief Officer Wilde that they should swing out the lifeboats. Wilde responds that he would like to wait for the captain's order to do so first. As a result, Lightoller inquires with the captain, and the captain says to do so. Lightoller soon returns to ask the captain whether they should begin loading the boats, and the captain responds in the affirmative. The captain then joins Wilde and Lightoller on the port side. Before leaving the bridge, however, the captain tells Boxhall to begin trying to signal to the ship on the horizon by means of the Morse lamp and Titanic's distress rockets. The light appears to be moving closer to Titanic. Lifeboat 7 is the first to leave Titanic. Murdoch tells the crew in charge of the lifeboat to return to the gangway doors to take on more passengers. Murdoch was likely having trouble finding passengers to get into the lifeboats as many preferred Titanic's towering decks to a tiny lifeboat adrift at sea. Similarly, the crew also did not fully trust the new Welland David's strength as they bounced up and down while the lifeboats lowered. Despite this, Pittman is impressed that the number of crew needed to swing out and lower lifeboat is greatly reduced with the new design. On the port side, the captain, Wilde, and Lightoller begin working at lifeboat 4. They decide that it will be easier to load passengers from the promenade deck rather than the boat deck. As a result, they have it hooked up to the coal guy wire along A deck and lowered flush. However, they are likely thinking of Olympics A deck arrangement, where the entirety of the A deck promenade was open. On Titanic, however, the forward half of the A-deck promenade was enclosed. First-class passenger Hugh Woolner informs the captain of this fact, which Smith then acknowledges. He orders the windows to be opened while the crew move on to boats 6 and 8. Concurrently with lifeboat 7, Pittman works to load passengers into lifeboat 5. Ismay hovers around the lifeboat throughout its entire loading process. He seems to be growing more and more nervous throughout the process. Once it is ready to lower, Murdoch orders Pittman to take charge. He shakes hand with Pittman and says, Goodbye, good luck to you. Pittman, who still believes the ship will be fine, is a little shocked and confused by this gesture, but he shakes the first officer's hand and boards the lifeboat. Lowe joins them just as lifeboat 5 begins its descent. Ismay, who is now incredibly nervous and is shocked at how slowly the lifeboat is ascending to the water, grabs onto the falls and shouts, Lower away! over and over again. Lowe pulls him off the fall and responds, Do you want me to lower away quickly? You will have me drown the whole lot of them. Ismay subsequently backs off. As boat 5 descends, Pittman worriedly and loudly asks the other crew members in the boat if the plug has been installed. Lowe, who is already bothered by having to adapt to his situation after suddenly waking up and having a deal with Ismay, shouts down to Pittman, It is your own blooming business to see that the plug is in anyhow. Soon afterward, 4th Officer Boxhall fires the first distress rocket. In the light created by the rocket, Quartermaster George Rowe on the docking bridge sees one of the lifeboats in the water. He tries to phone the bridge to inquire what is happening. When Boxhall picks up, he asks Rowe if he is 3rd Officer Pittman. Rowe responds that he is just a quartermaster, and Boxhall asks him to bring extra rocket detonators to the bridge. From then on, Boxhall and Rowe continuously try to hail the ship on the horizon. The lights now seem much closer. They have gone from a single masthead light to an entire row of lights. The starboard side continues to move quickly as lifeboat 3 is lowered before even a single boat on the port side. However, after their mistake with lifeboat 4, the captain, Wilde, and Lightoller continue with lifeboat 6. Quartermaster Robert Hitchens was in charge of this lifeboat, with lookout Frederick Fleet also present. As boat 6 lowers, the passengers in the boat have to push the boat away from the side of the ship to prevent it from scraping against the hull. Hitchens then shouts to the deck crew that they do not have any seamen to help row. Lightoller then sends down Major Arthur Pushin, who climbs down the falls into the boat. From the port side lifeboat stations, Chief Officer Wilde heads to the starboard side, where he asks Murdoch where Titanic's firearms are kept. Despite it being the job of the first officer to keep track of the firearms, Murdoch has no idea. Wilde is then reminded of how Titanic's crew had a last minute shuffle before departure, where Wilde was brought on as chief officer, Murdoch was demoted to first officer, and Lightoller was demoted to second officer. The former second officer, David Blair, was removed from the ship. As a result, Wilde then goes to the former first officer, Lightoller, and asks him about the firearms. Lightoller then leads Wilde and Murdoch to Murdoch's cabin where he shows them that the arms are in one of the closets. Wilde distributes the arms to them and the captain before they return to their lifeboat stations. Lifeboat 1 is in a peculiar position on the boat deck. It is one of Titanic's emergency lifeboats, the other being lifeboat 2. As a result, it is always swung out and has a lower capacity. It is also the only lifeboat that cannot be lowered next to the deck, as a bulwark separates it from the side. Inboard of the bulwark sits collapsible sea. Due to all these obstacles, many passengers likely leave the area due to the boat's inaccessibility. 
It is so difficult to reach that first class passenger Charles Stengel trips and rolls over the bulwark, landing in the lifeboat. Murdoch laughs and remarks, that is the funniest sight I have seen tonight. Only 12 people board the boat. Murdoch, likely wanting to move on to the many aft boats he has to begin work on, orders the boat away. They momentarily stop at A deck to take on passengers there. Upon finding none, they continue down to the water. However, the boat eventually got caught around B deck by a guy wire and had to be freed. It was therefore delayed in reaching the water. After lowering lifeboat 8, Wild and Lightoller continue aft, leaving lifeboat 4 hanging by A deck. The captain returns to the bridge. 6th Officer Moody and 5th Officer Lowe are already at the aft lifeboats. They converse about how only Pittman has left Titanic so far, and more of the lifeboats should be manned by officers. They agree that Lowe will take charge of either lifeboat 14 or 16, and Moody will follow soon after. Therefore, Moody continues loading lifeboat 16, while Lowe begins work on 14. First class stewardess Violet Jessup arrives at boat 16. She notes that Moody looks very tired, and she gives him a smile to cheer him up. Once she boards the lifeboat, Moody says, look after this, will you, and hands her a baby. Soon afterward, Moody orders the boat away and crosses over to the starboard side, completely disregarding his tryst with Lowe. Wild, Lightoller, and Lowe continue loading the aft port side lifeboats. The passengers in the area start to become more and more rowdy. Crew members inform Lowe that the passengers around 14 are becoming desperate. They try their best to maintain order, but struggle. A rumor passes around the deck that men are getting off on the port side, and as a result, many men start congregating around these lifeboats. First class passenger Lillian Bentham remembers hearing gunshots while she was thrown into lifeboat 12. After loading and lowering lifeboat 9, Murdoch orders Moody down to A deck again to begin loading passengers from the promenade. The rest of the aft starboard lifeboats were loaded from there. The situation around lifeboat 14 is hectic. Able seaman Joseph Skerritt describes having to use the tiller of the lifeboat to keep passengers from rushing the boat. Many of the deck officers fear the worst case scenario, that the davits holding the lifeboat to the deck will snap, dropping all of its occupants into the sea. Second class passenger Esther Hart recalls an officer shooting his revolver into the air shouting, the next man who puts his foot in this boat, I will shoot him down like a dog. Finally, holding up his end of his deal with Moody, 5th officer Lowe takes charge of lifeboat 14. As it lowers past A deck, Lowe spots a large group of passengers about to rush the lifeboat. Lowe is tense. He sees the davits bouncing up and down as the lifeboat lowers restlessly into the water. He equips his personal revolver and fires three shots along the side of the ship, which scares the group away from the boat. Lifeboat 11 is a similar story. At around this time, many third class passengers had congregated on the aft well deck, waiting for a gate to be opened, which would allow them passage to the boat deck. However, upon seeing many of the aft lifeboats leave the ship, they become desperate and climb over the gate. As a result, many of them arrive at the deck around this time. Lifeboat 11 is lowered relatively peacefully in comparison, however, first class passenger Edith Rosenbaum recalls being thrown into 11. Upon reaching the water, passengers in 11 are splashed by Titanic's condenser discharge, pumping water out of Titanic's boilers. Lifeboats 13 and 15 are loaded concurrently. More and more passengers are reaching the promenade, and more and more are taking radical measures to get off the ship. Third class passenger Eugene Daly, after putting his wife and friend in one of these lifeboats, takes a spot for himself. An officer on deck tells him to get out, but Daly ignores him. The officer then forcibly grabs Daly and throws him back onto the deck. Many people continue boarding 13 and 15, and many of them think the lifeboat is becoming overloaded. When 13 is lowered, it is the most occupied lifeboat yet. It is only beaten by 15, lowering only a few minutes afterwards. In fact, 15 is the only lifeboat to be above capacity. First class steward Samuel Rule estimates that there are about 68 people on board. After loading 13 and 15, Murdoch crosses over to the port side. He finds lifeboat 10, still in its chocks on the deck. He begins preparing the lifeboat for loading by swinging out the lifeboat over the side of the ship. As 13 reaches the water, it is also hit by the condenser discharge. However, it is then pushed aft by the wash created. This removes any slack on the lifeboat falls, and 13 is stuck to Titanic. Directly above 13 is lifeboat 15. The passengers in 13 realize the predicament they are in and begin shouting up to the deck crew to stop lowering 15. The passengers in 15 hear the calls and join in shouting up to the deck. By this time, Moody is on A deck and is unable to help while Murdoch has already crossed over to Titanic's port side to begin work on lifeboat 10. Therefore, 15 continues downward on top of 13. Fireman Frederick Barrett, who is in lifeboat 13, begins trying to push it away from Titanic's side using the oars. These efforts are futile. Barrett then rushes to the afterfall of 13, jumping over passengers in the process, and begins cutting the falls. Barrett is successful, and 13 slides out from under 15, just before 15 reaches the water. After lowering the aft lifeboats, Chief Officer Wild proceeds forward to begin work at lifeboat 2. The captain joins him on the port bridge wing as the lifeboat is loaded. Unbeknownst to Wild, many male crew members had boarded the lifeboat and are waiting for the lifeboat to lower. 
The captain grabs his megaphone and shouts, How many of you crew are in that boat? Get out of there, every man of you. They promptly leave the lifeboat. As lifeboat 2 is almost ready, the captain proceeds to 4th officer Boxhall, who is on the bridge, trying to signal to the lights on the horizon. After Boxhall was able to see a row of lights lining the side of the distant ship, the lights began to drift away and are becoming dimmer. Giving up on the idea that the ship will aid Titanic, the captain points to lifeboat 2 and tells Boxhall to board it. Boxhall complies and takes charge of the lifeboat. Upon realizing that the ship on the horizon is not going to save Titanic's passengers, the captain grabs his megaphone and begins hailing lifeboats. The original idea of trying to get as many lifeboats away quickly, with the assumption that the ship on the horizon would come to Titanic's aid, had backfired. Now Smith's goal is to fill the lifeboats as much as possible. He first calls lifeboat 2 and orders them to proceed around Titanic's stern to the starboard gangway doors. Boxhall complies, and 2 begins heading aft. Next, the captain calls lifeboat 6. Quartermaster Robert Hitchens is in control of the boat and hears the captain calling. However, he refuses to return, claiming that they are already quite full and more passengers would swamp the boat. Hitchens overall was having either a panic attack or a mental breakdown throughout the night, and was using this emotional state to inform his decision making. As a result, he did not return to the ship. First Officer William Murdoch has finally gotten Lifeboat 10 swung out and ready for loading. However, by this point, Titanic's port list has grown tremendously. The gap between the boat deck and the lifeboat is estimated to be a yard or more. Furthermore, most of the desperate passengers have fled, trying to get a place in one of the last lifeboats forward. They were not hopeful about 10, as it was still in its chocks on the deck. As a result, the scene around lifeboat 10 is of reluctance to board. Murdoch and the immediate crew are having to forcibly throw passengers across the gap into the lifeboat. Once the boat is ready to lower, a woman's heel gets caught in the lip of the deck. She falls between Titanic's side and lifeboat 10. Luckily, she's caught by a group of passengers on A-deck. She then comes back up to the boat deck and boards before 10 is lowered away. At the same time as lifeboat 10, 2nd officer Lightoller is hard at work at lifeboat 4. The windows at the A-deck promenade have been opened, and Lightoller can begin loading the boat. He's lucky that they had earlier tied number 4 to the coal guy wire, as it does not swing out as far as 10. Lightoller places deck chairs, first as a step up to the window, and then between the ship and the lifeboat to make boarding easier. As lifeboat 4 lowers to the water, first class passenger Emily Ryerson recalls A-deck being only 20 feet from the water level. Work now begins at Titanic's collapsible lifeboats. Much earlier, quartermaster Robert Hitchens had removed the boat cover for a collapsible D, showing that work had begun, but now the hard part comes. The crew have to raise the block and falls which had previously been used for lifeboats 1 and 2, swing the davits back inward, connect the block and falls to the collapsible lifeboats, raise the lifeboats above the bulwark, swing the lifeboats over the side of the ship, and lower them flush with the bulwark. This process slows things down on the deck, which makes the passengers much more desperate. Chief Officer Wilde joins First Officer Murdoch on the starboard side to work on Collapsible C. Once it is swung out, they begin the loading process. While some passengers report a chaotic mess around the boat, others report the loading process being orderly. Once it is ready to lower, there is room for more people. As a result, Wilde and Murdoch allowed J. Bruce Ismay and a couple other men around the boat to board. Quartermaster George Rowe had continued firing distress rockets after Boxhall had left the ship. The captain tells him to join Murdoch at Collapsible C, where he is then told to take charge of the boat. As C descends, Rowe describes having to use oars to push the collapsible away from Titanic's side. They fear that the rivets will damage the lifeboat or cause it to flip. Rowe also notices that the forward well deck is flooding and the forecastle is beginning to submerge. At around this time, the captain returns to the wireless room and informs Phillips and Bride that the engine room is flooding and that they will not likely have power to send messages for much longer. Inspired by this, Phillips hands over the key to Bride and takes a look on deck. Upon returning, Phillips mentions that the well deck is awash. At Collapsible D, things are much more hectic. Upon arriving at the lifeboat, Lightheller finds multiple male passengers already boarded. He points his unloaded revolver at them and forces them to get back on Titanic. As more passengers arrive at D, assuming it is the final lifeboat on the ship, they continuously try to rush it. Lightheller and the deck crew are forced to link arms and form a barrier around the station. Later on, Wilde joins Lightheller and helps dissipate the crowd. However, there is a sudden rush of passengers emerging from below deck from the first class entrance which prevents the situation from improving. First class passenger Jane Hoyt describes seeing Chief Officer Wilde fire shots as the loading continued. Finally, Wilde and Lightheller call for all passengers to cross the starboard side to straighten out Titanic's port list. This likely has an ulterior motive of clearing the area. Lightheller is in the lifeboat helping people board as Wilde maintains order on deck. Once it is ready to lower, Wilde orders Lightheller to take charge of the lifeboat. Lightheller replies, not damn likely, and jumps back aboard Titanic in defiance. As Collapsible D is approaching the water, it gets caught in the falls. Lowering is temporarily halted. 
First class passenger Frederick Hoyt finds Captain Smith on deck, an old friend of his, who recommends that Frederick descend into the water and find a lifeboat. As Hoyt descends the emergency staircase to A deck, he finds Collapsible D still stuck in its falls. He lowers himself into the water and climbs aboard. Similarly, first class passengers Hugh Woolner and Moritz Bjornstrom Stephenson jump from the A deck promenade into Collapsible D right as water begins pouring over the bulwark. The falls at Collapsible D are likely not slackened by lowering recommencing, but instead by Titanic itself sinking at an accelerated pace into the water. The ship's officers now begin work on collapsibles A and B. The equipment to properly get these boats down from the officer's quarters is hundreds of feet underwater in the ship's bow. As a result, they use the canvas cover spars and lifeboat oars as support to push the lifeboats onto the deck gradually. Light Taller works at collapsible B, while Murdoch and Moody work at collapsible A. The captain returns to the wireless room. He is likely aware that the efforts at the collapsible boats are the operator's only chance to escape the ship. He relieves them of their duty before returning to the bridge. Phillips, in a trance at the key, continues hopelessly tapping out messages. The key no longer has enough power to transmit very far. Phillips likely feels the burden of Titanic's passengers on his shoulder. He knows that the only chance for their survival is getting in contact with a ship that will arrive before Titanic sinks. He may even be aware of the light on the horizon, and is desperately tapping out messages in the hope that their wireless operator comes back online in these final moments. Harold Bride describes the intense emotions in the shack. I learned to love him that night and I suddenly felt a great reverence to see him standing there, sticking to his work while everyone else was raging about. I will never live to forget the work Phillips did for those last awful 15 minutes. Bride then moved from the main wireless room to his shared cabin with Phillips to begin collecting their things. A stoker suddenly enters the wireless room and tries to slip Phillips' life belt off him. Bride flies at the stoker. He grabs an object off the desk and strikes the stoker, knocking him out cold. I suddenly felt a passion not to let that man die a decent sailor's death. I wish he might have stretched rope or walked a plank. I did my duty. I hope I finished him. I don't know. We left him on the cabin floor of the wireless room, and he was not moving. This intense situation breaks Phillips out of the trance. Realizing the severity of the situation, Phillips and Bride flee the wireless room onto the portside boat deck. Bride heads to collapsible B, while Phillips joins the masses of people rushing towards Titanic stern. Thomas Andrews is spotted throwing deck chairs off the boat deck to people swimming in the water. Andrews then proceeds forward to the bridge. Mess steward Cecil Fitzpatrick, who still believes that Titanic is going to stay afloat, hears the captain tell Andrews, We cannot stay any longer. She's going. Upon receipt of this news, Fitzpatrick collapses along the wall of the bridge. He recovers and realizes that collapsible A is likely his only chance for survival, and he proceeds onto the starboard boat deck. Meanwhile, the captain and Andrews likely enter the sea together as water begins pouring over the port side bridge wing. Samuel Hemming is at the Davits for lifeboat number one. He has just finished untangling the falls and tries to hand the block up to 6th Officer Moody, who is on the roof of the officer's quarters. Moody replies, We don't want the block. We'll leave the boat on the deck. His intentions are clear. Moody recognizes that Titanic does not have much time left. He wants to float Collapsible A off the boat deck instead of hooking it up to the Davids and hoisting it over the side. Soon afterward, Moody and Murdoch succeed in pushing Collapsible A off the roof of the officer's quarters. It crashes down, breaking the oars and cover spars supporting it. Against Moody's orders, the Collapsible is hooked up to the falls. On the other side of the boat deck, Light Taller and his deck crew push Collapsible B off of the officer's quarters unsuccessfully. It flips upside down as it drops onto the boat deck. At this point, the water is steadily rising up. Harold Bride grabs onto an oarlock as Collapsible B is washed off. Meanwhile, Light Taller realizes that there's nothing more to be done on Titanic's port side. He crosses over the officer's quarters and peers onto the starboard boat deck. He spots Murdoch, faithfully sticking to his duty, trying to push Collapsible A to the lifeboat station for number one. The boat is caught between the falls and the forward funnel cable stays. Light Huller also realizes that the situation on the starboard side is futile. He walks on top of the bridge to what has become the very front of Titanic and dives forward. Suddenly, Titanic's port list eases, plunging the starboard side into the water. Many passengers are swept off the deck and a frenzy ensues. Passengers and crew quickly try to cut the falls, holding collapsible A to the deck. Many passengers describe the ship slightly rising for a moment, which allows third class passenger Eugene Daly to succeed in cutting one of collapsible A's falls. However, the ship dives forward again. Collapsible A is picked up and pushed aft. It crashes into the other lifeboat davits as passengers desperately try to push it away from the ship. After cutting the fall, however, Eugene Daly jumps off Titanic into the open sea. He describes the scene he finds. Everything I touch seemed to be women's hair. Children crying, women screaming, and their hair in my face. My god, if I can only forget those hands and faces that I touched. As the plunge continues, Lightler turns back towards the ship and swims towards the descending deck. He suddenly pulled under and pinned to one of the many vents leading to the bottom of the ship. He believes he is finished when a burst of hot water and air shoots up from the lower deck. He pops out onto the surface adjacent to Collapsible B. Just ahead of him, the cable stage for the forward funnel begin to snap. 
The funnel crashes down, landing just inches from Collapsible B. The energy from the falling mass creates a wave which picks up Collapsible B and sends it flying away from the ship. Titanic rips herself apart. As Titanic's stern returns to a level position, many survivors in the lifeboats momentarily believe that this section will remain afloat. Before realizing that the ship was sinking, Thomas Andrews had told passengers that Titanic could be split into three separate parts. Each part would remain afloat individually. In a cruel twist of fate, Andrews' premonition comes true, providing a false sense of hope for those in the lifeboats and likely for those still on board. At 2.20 a.m., Titanic disappears, leaving only a cloud of mist. 1,496 people perish with her.